you're looking for the bottom 10% properties in this entire neighborhood. There's a baseline of quality. So if you're in a C-class neighborhood, the first thing that I look at is roofs, windows, siding, paint, signs of vacancy. Some of the only things that you can find out if your eyes are on the property, you have to drive by that house to figure that out. Welcome to the podcast, Real Estate Investing with Coach Carson. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show to help you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. I'm here today with Anson Young, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which he happens to be an expert on, which is how to find good deals. So Anson, I'm going to introduce him real briefly, then we'll jump into it. He is a real estate agent and an investor. He's in Denver, Colorado. He wrote the book, from Bigger Pockets, also who published my book called The Book on Finding and Funding Good Deals. And I think most importantly, the biggest compliment I can give someone is Anson actually is doing the business. He's in the trenches. He's always learning. He's adapting. So Anson, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Chad. I am so excited to talk to you today. I know we we, we talk here and there over the years, but uh, but yeah, I just enjoy uh, what what you have to teach, and I'm here to learn too. So, <laughs> likewise, always always a student here as well. So, thank you for being here. So, we we discussed a little bit ahead of time what would be fun. I, I thought it would be cool. I love case studies. I love examples, and sometimes just learning the tips you give inside of an example or make it even come to life even more. So I'm going to ask you a, a scenario, and let's let's kind of play around here. So you live in Denver, Colorado. That's been your I market do. for a while. But if I took you out of Denver, I dropped you in another city. Let's just call it a small city. Now it's not it's not New York or Chicago or L.A. It's a <laughs> you know it's a 300,000 person city. It's got a good economy. You know things are generally good. Yeah. But I but I plop you down in this new city, and my my challenge for you, Anson, as someone who knows how to find deals, is in the next 90 days, you had to go out and find at least one good rental property. At least one. If you found more, that's great. And I, and I ask this because I think a lot of people listening to this are in this situation. They, they want to find another deal in the next 90 days. And so I want to just go through a list of like scenarios with you here. So we, that's, the, that's the background. That's the scenario. Let's, let's start with, you can start wherever you want, but I was thinking, you know, like, how would you choose where in that city to invest? How would you, how, first of all, how would you build a buy box to even know like, what would you invest? So let's, let's run with it and see what you think. No, this is this is great because this is some of what I do um, for the last like two years or so. We've been buying out of state, and so this is uh, this is something that I that I really enjoy, and I, and I like the scenario too. I was excited when you uh, sent it over because um, one of my first real estate mentors talked about this a lot, and so <laughs> now. Uh, putting it into practice, that's a whole different thing. But um, so yeah, where I would start is is really diving into the data inside of that city. And that I, I think that that 300,000 uh, population, that's a really good, I, I like that size. Uh, you're not competing with like insane hedge funds and, and you know, a lot of iBuyers and stuff. And so you have some room to compete, which is nice. Um, so 300,000, there's only going to be, you know, um, I don't know how many houses inside of that. Let's just say 100, 150,000 single families that you'd want to, you know, a target. But the data is going to tell you a whole lot. And so, um, so there'll be, there'll be two phases to this. So first is the data. I'd go into like list source. I'd go into public data, public records, and really find out where uh, inside of that city the properties are selling. Um, you know, where other investors are buying and kind of that, that will leave you some clues onto where you possibly want to buy. Um, and so, you know, finding out where the, where the volume is, uh, going in, uh, you know, any, any data that you can find inside of that. Cause the second part would be to also, you know, contact an agent and see if they can pull data on their side on where investors are buying, where these properties are being listed. If you're looking specifically for rentals, um, where income properties are being listed and, and, and where those concentrations are. Because obviously you're not going to want to blanket the whole town. There's going to be, you know, the, the million dollar houses over here and then like apartments or, or uh, condos, maybe something that's not inside your buy box in a lot of those areas. So you're really, for me, I want to find out where are the other investors are buying, what they're buying them for and seeing, you know, start to build out that buy box of what makes sense. You can also take data from like Rent-A-Meter and, uh, and then you can contrast like, hey, buyers are buying in this zip code on this side of town. They're buying for, 
120,000. Um, there's some good volume over there of investors who are buying uh, cash purchases, or you can look for hard money purchases, whatever that looks like. And then taking that rentimeter data, and you can really just say, okay, well, they're buying for 120, maybe it needs, you know, 30,000 in work. Rentimeter is saying that over there, uh, they're renting for 1400 or 1500, something like that. So then, you know, you're roughly in a 1% deal zip code in that area. You can start to buy, everybody's buy box is different. Yours is different than mine. <laughs> Everybody listening to this has a different one. Um, so it's going to be up to you what, if that makes sense, if like a 1% deal makes sense based on, you know, your down payment or however else you're doing it. Um, but that will help you narrow down what those areas look like, how much uh, you can buy properties for and what the rents are going to be. And that's going to be, you know, 80, 80, 90 percent of your buy box right there. If if that makes sense, now you have an area to target. I, I really like this step, this first step, because you're you know, before you get in the weeds and we're going to get in the weeds. And we're going to talk about details, but you, you sort of get this holistic view of the important stats as a real estate investor, the price, the rent. How do those match up? You know, what kind of town are you looking at? And I, I find it really interesting. You talked about the volume because some investors might be thinking in their head, well, I don't want to go and like compete with all the investors who are buying, but you're saying like, actually look where the investors buying. What, 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 why is that? And then also my follow-up question is how, how would you actually identify where more investors are buying? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, to that first question, like, you know, wouldn't that be more competition? Wouldn't that be more of a headache? <laughs> like, are you just like following the lemmings off the cliff kind of thing? Um, but not not really, because there's only so many areas in a in a town where it would, it would make sense for investors to 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 buy to capture those rental metrics, uh, flip metrics, whatever you're looking at. Um, you know, there's going to be some places that are just like, hey, this is the really really good school district, and like those those are just priced out of your price range. So like there goes half the town right there, right? And then so there's only going to be certain areas of town that are going to make sense if. If you're just landed in town, unless you have like a really good agent who's going to tell you like, well, this area is great and a lot of investors are buying here, but this area right here is actually turning around and not a lot of investors are looking there yet. Like there are, there's always going to be insider or like, you know, inside baseball and some of those things. But, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be scared of the competition inside of there. I would, you know, there's a reason why investors are buying there. Like if the, if the metrics make sense, then it makes sense for, for you and your buy box. It's not going to make sense for you to go across town just to buy where, you know, just because investors are buying over here and not over here. Like it's, it's just going to make more sense to start at least with, you know, what's, what's working for other people and then building from there. Um, it could be like the fringes of that area. It could be like, <clears throat> um, an area just adjacent to there, you know, may have lower volume, but the metrics are still good. Um, but <clears throat> without knowing the data, you're not going to know, you're just going to be shooting blind all across town. So at least narrow it down here and there, there might be a, you know, a tier of like, this is the, this is where the most investors are buying, but these two areas are, are not as many investors are buying. And then you'll have to just, just, determine why that is and if it still makes sense for you. Um, and then how to figure out <laughs> how many investors are buying there. Um, so I think two ways come to mind. The first would be back to listsource.com. Um, you can search inside of there for sold properties and uh, the type of loan that those investors are getting or, or that those people are getting. So if you find, uh, you know, you, you can find cash sales, you can search by loans. It is, not the most user-friendly website. Um, there are other places too, like uh, PropStream. Uh, there's other services that you can, you know, none of this is going to be 100% free, uh, but it's going to be pretty cheap compared to, um, you know, when you start marketing or something. <laughs> so uh, so a, a place like that will let you search by cash sales. Um, a place like ListSource will let you narrow things down a little bit more um, to figure out you know, you can actually see inside the zip codes of where the most cash transactions are and, and go from there. If you want to narrow it down further from there and try to capture hard money loans, private money loans, uh, you know, DSCR loans, whatever that looks like, so that you can go, okay, well, here's the cash investors and the investors who also need to get a loan because there's plenty of us who do that too. Um, this is where they're all buying. 
um, a place like PropStream, I think you can search by cash. Um, and there are probably a few others, but uh, also a real estate agent should be able to look up cash sales um, or search by financing inside of uh, different areas of town. So if they search by the whole area, they pull all the ca recent cash transactions in the last three months, um, then you should get a heat map from that data as well. And that will probably be the cheapest data, but you have to get to know a real estate agent and uh, convince them that you're worthy of <laughs> working yeah. with to, to do that work for you. <laughs> Well, okay. let's let, let's go. That's really good information. Let's go with the agent conversation because I was going to kind of circle back around to that. But with you being having a real estate license, also yeah. being an investor, and if, if you're getting plopped in a new city and have to buy something in the next ninety days, like how important is a kind of go to agent? Like I, I to me, like real estate is such a team sport, and I mm -hmm. feel like it's, it's kind of like sports. And if you have a good team, that really makes a big difference. But how, for you, like how how important would be finding that agent be for you in your case? Oh, definitely. It would be one of the first people that I try to talk to. Um, they would, you know, that might be a really good shortcut on where to look in town, you know, based on their experience. So if you're, if you're capturing a good agent with good experience, then that could be a, a really good shortcut into what those next steps are, where those areas are. And if they're, they are good and experienced, they would know like, Hey, these, these areas are great. This, these areas are up and coming. You know, I'm seeing a lot more activity over here, or I help some investors buy some some properties like right along this area where we think that light rail is going to go in or something like that. There's always things that you're you don't know when you just plop into a town. So, um, and so yeah, like as an agent myself, I have no qualms about handing that over to somebody else who knows more than I do in the area and uh, and relying on their expertise to meet to meet my goals and create a win-win scenario for sure. Yeah, same here. How important is it to you, answer that they are also an investor? Do they need to have rental properties for you to want to work with them? No, be, well, not necessarily. Mainly because there's there's a small percentage of agents who also own real estate as investments, which is kind of sad, right? Like we're on the front lines every day. You think that every single agent would own property? Um, I think somebody asked me that question the other day, which is like. Like this just seems too easy. If if you can make money from rentals, why doesn't everybody own a rental? And it's like, well, people are people, and they all have different scenarios. But um, I, I I would still absolutely work all day long with a uh, an agent who doesn't invest themselves or hasn't invested themselves yet, uh, but they have helped other investors um, get to that finish line and meet their goals. I think that out of the uh, agents that I'm working with in in our markets out of state. Um, maybe out of the four markets, maybe one is actually just an investor. Uh, the other three are rock stars and they know exactly what to look for. And that's like, you know, 90% of the battle right there is, is, you know, you could have an agent who's worked with, you know, a uh, hundred investors and had really good successful deals, but then throws all their money in the stock market or something. And so that's just maybe not their, you know, their personal forte but they're good at what they do. And I, I want that person who's good at what they do over uh, that metric of like, well, do you invest yourself? That's great, but that can also create some competition and some conflict of interest. Like as an agent, I'm not gonna take on any fix and flip investors in Denver because I'm just a conflict of interest. Like I'm gonna take down that deal if I find it. <laughs> yeah, so, good point. Good point. so yeah. Yeah, so, the, so there's a peculiarity in the agent world that not all of them invest, but you do look at how much experience they have buying for other investors, show me your track record, yep. and also just testing their knowledge. So going back to this kind of main topic, which I love, is you really just got to get, it's almost like if you were an Olympic athlete, you 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 have to get lift weights, you have a train, like your training as a real estate investor is this knowledge of the market, the sales, the rents, where the volume is. So like you're, you're basically doing an intensive training and you're trying to get a coach kind of to help you out up front with this agent. And so, so what's you, do you, what's you zoom in on a particular location, how small of a location would you start hunting in to find deals? Like, would you just do like a zip code? Would you do like, you know, the whole city? Like how, how would you zone in on a, on a location? Yeah. And that, and some of that's going to depend on your budget, you know, like what, what methods you are going after. Um, you know, if it's, if I'm only going to rely on some agents to, uh, give me listed properties or hopefully some pocket listings, I'm going to have to go a little wide 
uh, because there's only so many listings that pop up in a given amount of time. Um, so I'm going to have to go a little wider in that in that respect. And, you know, and again, depending on budget, if I have, you know, a lot of money to throw at this, I'm going to go wide. I'm going to throw a lot of money at marketing and I'm going to filter those leads as they come in. Like that's that's one scenario. The other scenario is if I don't have a big budget, um, I'm going to go pick, you know, four, five, six neighborhoods, go driving for dollars. I'm going to go, you know, do the cheapest things possible that are still highly effective. So I'm going to drive for dollars. I'm going to skip trace those people. I'm going to cold call them, you know, or I'm going to send them, you know, some, some mail. But uh, so it's, it's really going to depend on kind of your, your goals and your budget. If I'm looking for one property this year, that's going to look a lot different than if I'm looking for two properties a month for the whole year. You know, those are, those are much different game plans in the, in the coach Carson world of, uh, of sports. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go with that smaller one because okay. I, you know, I, I've been in the two deals per per month and I know that's, there's a whole, it's a fun game, but it's also a little bit different game plan and it's a little different reinvestment of your money. So people should think about maybe going there someday, but let's sure. say you are in that one or two deals and let's say you're on a budget because yeah. you've, because you, you know, you're saving your money for the down payment, you're just scrounging by. So like you mentioned driving for dollars, Let, let's focus that on some of the ways that once you have your neighborhood picked out, like what, what are some of your go-to ways on a budget, try to, trying to get this deal locked up in the next couple, couple months? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And I'll, uh, driving for dollars as a full disclaimer is still like my favorite list of all time. Um, it's still working in 2023. If you're listening to this in 2025, it's probably still working. So <laughs> Yes. It <laughs> so it's part of that evergreen content. Um, it, worked, it worked for me back in 2003. It worked in 2010. Yeah, it worked exactly. In I mean, this is this is one of those like it's not scalable that really that, right. that easily. So it's like everybody, the people who actually do it and put the effort in, get results. I've, I found and the same thing. That is yeah. That's that's the perfect way to put it. So um, so yeah. What you're you know what you're looking for is uh, you're looking for kind of the 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 bottom 10 percent properties in this entire neighborhood. Um, hopefully the entire neighborhood's not so you know, trash that it's really hard to find like the worst ones, but in most neighborhoods, you know, there's a, there's a baseline of, of quality. So if you're in a C class neighborhood, you know, almost all the houses there are going to be presentable, you know, uh, in different, you know, different landscaping, uh, things. Some people may mow their lawn, some people don't water their lawn, whatever that looks like. But what you're looking for is you're really looking for, you know, the first thing that I look at is roofs, um, at least uh, here in Denver, that's a huge metric on, uh, you know, we get a lot of hailstorms. So if you have an old roof that's like 20 years old and it hasn't been replaced like six times in the last 20 years, um, I know that there's some sort of deferred maintenance uh, issue going on there. Um, you know, roofs, you're looking at windows, you're looking at siding, paint, uh, you're looking at overgrown uh, you know, yard, you're looking for signs of vacancy. Sometimes, you know, it, it's really weird. Like you can drive by a property and just tell it's vacant. Like after a while, <laughs> like you just get the sixth sense of like, nobody lives there. Um, you know, it could just be like the curtains are slightly open and you can kind of see all the way through the house and there's no, you know, furniture, um, or it's closed up and it snowed recently and there's no tracks in and out. There's no car tracks, none of that. Um, uh, it could be piled up, you know, like kind of the, the old school ones, piled up newspapers, piled up mail, those kind of things. Um, I've had red tags on the door of like, hey, this property is going to be condemned. Um, I've had, you know, full on, you know, the hoarder situation in the house has gotten so crazy that it now spilled out onto the front yard. <laughs> and you can, just, <laughs> you can just tell that, you know, uh, that this is going to be one that you're going to target and put on your list. And so, you know, in, in a nutshell, those are the things you're looking for. Deferred maintenance. Uh, the, some of the only things you can see that you can find out if your eyes are on the property, your eyeballs are just directly on it. You're not going to find that on any list that you pull. You're not going to find any of those things uh, on you know, just a record that you can pull. You have to like drive by that house to figure that out. I've noticed recently that a lot of investors are frustrated and even lost with a tough market cycle right now. Interest rates are up, prices are up too, which means cash flow is tough to come by. But I also know that the most profit is made as an investor during times of change and uncertainty. That's right now and I'm seeing it firsthand which is why I've decided to start a private online community and coaching program called Rental Property Mastery to help you adapt and then thrive in a changing economy as a small and mighty investor. 
and I'll help you make progress with regular feedback and coaching from me and other experienced investors, regular accountability through small action teams that meet weekly, and deep learning on how to buy rentals, finance them, and manage them passively. Your journey as a rental investor can be lonely, but you can get the support you need from me and a community of fellow investors inside Rental Property Mastery. Just visit coachcarson.com forward slash RPM. The first 30 new members can get a permanent $500 discount using the coupon code RPM2023. Got it. So you put those on a list. Do you, do you have a particular method that you would do, particularly if you're on a budget? Do you just put it on a piece of paper? Do you have a use apps, uh, software, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I now only use software because it just makes life so much easier. If you're on a very strict budget, you're going to write that, you know, write it down. You're going to put it into a spreadsheet and then you're going to look it up on public records one by one. If you have a little bit of money to throw at this, let's just say a hundred bucks, um, then, a uh, an app like uh, Driving for Dollars, it's in the App Store. It's like the blue one, I think, is is the one I use. Um, and you can you can just click it on your on the app as you drive by. And then uh, when you hit go, it'll take all the ones that you compiled. It'll then skip trace them for you. And uh, and then by the time you get back to your you're back home, you'll have a spreadsheet in your email box that has all the addresses that you picked out, plus the uh, the mailing address, the owner name. Uh, phone numbers, if they could be found, uh, email addresses, even um, if those are attached to the record as well. So it it saves you a lot of time um, and isn't that expensive. I know that there's other ones out there. Uh, Deal Machine, um, Backflip has uh, Driving for Dollars app. Um, there's there, there's a few more uh, technology solutions. But if you're like on a very strict budget and you only have money for gas, um, then the old, the old school method of writing it down and then looking it up on public records, um, that's going to be the way that you go. Yeah, it could work. I've done it before. I know Anson's probably done it. I, oh yeah. At the same time, man, these apps are so amazing. Like if I had those apps, when I first started, like 500 bucks, 200 yep. bucks, a thousand, I mean, I, whatever I had to spend, like to be able to press a button and start sending mail while I'm out at the house. Like really? Yeah. Like that's, that's just, it saves so much time. I, I remember going back to the house and I mean, it was hours of like looking up stuff, yeah. organizing the spreadsheet, then sending the letters and doing all that. So it's, you know, even if I have a great campaign, I did so much better by handwriting. I'm doing all that. It's the difference there of just getting it out the door. I've yeah. seen so many people just like not get it out the door. So the, the fact that there's some apps like that, that makes so much easier just to me is a, a big game changer. Yeah, it's huge. I don't know if you ever did this, but that phase one where you write down all the addresses and then it like sits on your desk for yes. weeks and months. <laughs> I think I came back to a list and I was like, I was like, when did I, when did I drive this list? And it must've been like over a year. And I'm like, oh, like yeah. it's kind of, it's almost useless now. It's not totally useless, but it's like, man, I never did that step two and I wasted all this time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's a great technique, but you got to get it done. So yep. I'll, I'll put links to a lot of these, a lot of the things you're saying, like list source, rentometer, driving for dollars, deal machine, all these, I'll, I'll put links to in the, in the show notes just so people can check those out. Perfect. All right. So driving for dollars is one we both love. It's kind of our go-to as well. Anything else you would do? Like, so you're, 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 it is one enough. I guess you're going to get an agent sending you listings. You're going to get yeah. driving for dollars. Is that, is that enough? Or do we throw a, do, do a little bit more? No, that's not enough, Chad. We got to do more. All right, um, good. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, if you're like, you know, raring to go and you need something in the next 90 days, you want to be in front of as many of these gatekeepers as possible. The people who, who have access to these deals. Um, I'm a huge fan of networking. Um, I run a networking group here in Denver. I started it for that reason is, you know, I want to talk to cool investors who are doing things, you know, each, uh, each and every month. And so, uh, so I would, you know, if, if I'm local, obviously you said I was dropped into that city. So I'm dropped in there and I have some extra time. Uh, so I'm going to go to these, I'm going to go to every networking, uh, meetup that I can. Uh, as it pertains to real estate investing. And so inside the inside of there, I'm going to be telling people that I'm looking for deals. I'm a serious buyer. Here's my buy box. I'm looking in these, this side of town or these zip codes. Um, so you're going to talk to probably a lot of wholesalers. Um, I think that wholesalers can be a necessary evil in this world. Uh, most of them are doing okay things. It's the it's the bad ones that they give them a bad name. But um, so yeah, so getting on a few wholesale lists is going to bolster that. There's always investors at these meetups who are like, hey, I'm a fix and flip guy. Uh, I come across deals every so often, but if it's not in my buy box, I just 
you know, you know, kind of, they're not a wholesaler, but they'll wholesale out those deals or they'll you know do something with them. And so you'll, you'll always be talking to people who are like, you know, Hey, I'm finding deals, but some of them don't work for me. Um, and you know, sometimes the metrics are different on a rental versus a flip. And so they'll be like, you know, if those metrics don't work, I'll keep you in mind. And, you know, you've talked to them and you've built up that rapport and networking with them. So trying to get, you know, I would try to get at least like five, six, seven other investors who are, you're on their radar. If they're wholesalers, then they're going to be sending you deals. Um, if they're that occasional wholesaler, uh, then keeping up on their radar for the next 90 days uh, will be ideal. But the more people that you can get in front of, the better uh, in order for that networking piece of like, hey, I'm looking for deals and I'm, you know, and I'm serious about it. So let's go. Um, that a lot of times will get you, you know, in front of a lot more deals so you can analyze them and see if they work for you. But yeah, between like doing your own marketing, the agent, and then kind of a team of investors who who are sending you deals, um, that's going to get you a lot better results than just the just the one thing. Like it. So kind of a three pronged approach. And of course, there's more <laughs> if you re read your book, like I highly recommend people read your book, because it's a whole kind of system of different ways you could do this. So there's education if you want to go even deeper on this. But let's assume all right, for, we spent the first month just going after it, going to network meetings, driving for dollars. And so we've got like this activity coming in. I've also seen a lot of people and you know, I've done this myself sometimes where you have activity coming in, but you don't handle the leads very well and that you let them fall through the cracks. So can you talk to me a little bit about your approach to staying organized, to handling these leads, people calling you, agents? So what, what kind of process would you put in place just to make sure you're not missing out on some of these opportunities as they come in? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because I think we've all been there. <laughs> um, yeah. Like calls coming in and then you have all these sticky notes everywhere or something. And, um, and so, yeah, I think getting on board with any kind of uh, CRM, so customer relationship management software, uh, there's a lot of free ones out there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, ClickUp or uh, the HubSpot, there's a, there's a bunch of them out there that are, that are free, that are, uh, that are totally usable, even if it's something like um, a Trello board. You know, if, if you've ever used Trello, you can kind of just at least organize things a little bit better and then move them through the different categories of, of, of how you set it up. But this could be a definitely a free or very cheap solution to staying organized. And I would try to put, you know, everybody that you meet inside of there. Uh, and then obviously when, when deals are coming in, there are ways to, you know, to, put those on different boards too. So I, I like digital solutions. I know that my friend Tucker used to put everything on a, like an income sheet, like incoming sheet. And then they would like post them all on the wall, you know, but it was like, Hey, if your office burns down, there goes all your leads. Right. <laughs> so, um, but at least it's better than nothing. So even if it's just, you know, printing out some, some papers with just some simple questions and some simple fields to fill in. That's better than nothing for sure. But I do like the di digital solutions because you can keep them a bit more organized. And if it's cloud-based, you can access them from anywhere, which is huge. So Yeah, I like that too. And <clears throat> the, the other thing is, I think people don't realize, and maybe you could speak to this a little bit, how much volume you probably need to get in order to get to get one deal at the bottom. So like th that was a big shocker for me when I was a new investor. It's like, wait a minute, like to get one deal, I might need to make 10 offers or 20 offers. Mm -hmm. And I might, to get 20 offers, I might need to have a hundred leads come in. So you have to be really organized to yeah. be able to even ha handle those leads. Do you, do you have a certain ratio that kind of plays out for you or people you're working with that, you know, between like starting the leads all the way down to like how many deals you actually get? Yeah. And I think, yeah, those are good uh, metrics to track uh, in the long term, for sure. Um, you know, and when you're starting out, you may not be as good, you know, on the phone or as good in person with uh, building rapport and talking to people and negotiating and all of those things. But I think in general, I think that that um, those metrics are pretty, pretty good for a newbie who would be like 100 leads or 100 properties that come in. Um, you'd probably be seriously going after maybe 20 of them, uh, maybe even 10. And then, you know, it would be probably 10 offers and you might get one of those um, that, that makes sense. There's always exceptions to that rule. You know, there's the guy who, you know, sent one letter 
and got you know one deal <laughs> like yeah. like that always happens um, or you talk to the right wholesaler on the right night he is about to lock up a property that's right in your you know right in your area and you know it could just be that one to one like that's why you try to get in front of those opportunities take as many swings as possible um, but but yeah if you're looking at it realistically you're like hey over the next month I need to get in like 80 to 100 leads that are coming in. You know, that could be like your your agents could be sending you, you know, 10 a day. Um, and, you know, they're going through not just new listings, but, you know, stuff that's been sitting on the market. Like, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of those that come in. So you could add up to 100 pretty quick and then filtering those down to are these inside my buy box? Now I can more seriously look at them. Um, in order to figure out if you need to put an offer in and you want to go go from there. But there's always those ones that are just like, hey, I just met this guy last night and he is about to lock up this deal. Um, it's happened to us before, for sure, where <laughs> even in, in even in a new new market that we've gone into, it was like we just talked to the right guy at the right exact time. That's going to happen. But you need to be prepared for that, for those, uh, you know, 110, one kind of metrics, I think is still good for a newbie. I th- I'm, I yeah. think so. Yeah, prepare prepare your mind for that. Be patient. Yeah. Be persistent. <laughs> and, and one of the things that the reason that, that ratio is like that is that you have to both filter out those leads and you also have to negotiate. And so I, I want to. I think mm. it's very valuable for newer investors to listen to people like you, Anson, who have done lots and lots of deals because there's a there's an art form. Just like somebody learns to be a doctor, or somebody learns how to be an engineer or a nurse. Like there's an art form and a practice of negotiating to buy properties. So there's a lot to talk about here, but I'm wondering if you could give just a couple tips on how you might approach talking to sellers, what might increase your likelihood that you could get more deals done? Yeah. And it's, you know, negotiation tactics work differently on a, you know, seller that you're talking to that came off of your driving for dollars list versus the, you know, your agent who's bringing you a deal. And now there's like two agents inside of this, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the middleman of this, of this negotiation um, versus like a wholesaler. Those are three kind of totally different negotiation scenarios, but in general, um, you know, you're really looking for to to get in front of their motivation. Like, why are they why are they selling? What are what are the actual needs here? Because not everything comes down to price, as we found out with a lot of off market deals, uh, any even listed deals. Sometimes it's not just price. It's going to be you know, and and getting to know and getting to the bottom of what that looks like is our number one goal. Like, we're trying to build authentic rapport with people whether it's an agent, whether it's the wholesaler, whether it's the direct seller, like that's our number one goal is like, you know, we're not faking it. We're, we really want to know like what the scenario is, what's going on, how we can help. And then, then we can craft an offer based on that. So sometimes it is price and you're just, you know, up against that wall. If it's not just price, if it's actually like a move out date, like they need to stay in the property for three extra weeks, but they need to close first you know, that's a different scenario. If they need to close in three days, like that's a different scenario. If it's the junk, like we've, we have a lot of the junk in the house is the, the number one stress factor for them. And so if you can tell them, Hey, you know, take whatever you need and leave the rest to us. Like we'll sell it. We'll donate it. We'll throw it away. Whatever that looks like, you know, it could be an inherited house and it's all grandma stuff. And she didn't have you know, good stuff. It was all like, it was kind of junk or hoarder stuff. That's a huge headache. If you live two or three States away, you're like, how am I going to clear out this house? Or it's going to be expensive to, to pay somebody to clear out this house. And then we have to sell it and we have to clean it up and fix it up. So like, that's the number one factor. It's not necessarily just the, the highest price possible. So you wouldn't know that unless you're, you know, trying to build authentic rapport with people and really find out what the actual deal is. Um, now, if it comes down to actual, just the price is the price, uh, that's the only thing that they care about. You know, you're really wanting to find out if you're in the same ballpark with your buy box first, that could just be one of those weeding out the ones that don't work. You know, they want 150, but your buy box is like 120 all in it. You know, it, unless you can get them down, unless you can just say, like, you know, show them the comps, show them what needs to be done to the property. Like, like, hey, our contractor walked through and he said that it's going to be, you know, $40,000 to fix up. So if we buy at one hundred and fifty, 
plus, you know, another 40, you're priced out of the highest priced, you know, properties in the neighborhood. And some people don't, don't know that. So by educating them a little bit on like, like, Hey, the ones that have sold just like your house are in this area, they're in the $120,000 area. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to attack it. Um, hopefully that's helpful. And if, and if I missed anything, definitely let me know. But, but when you're starting off, you really, you know, just trying to figure out what motivates them and what's the most important thing to them and go from there. Yeah. I, I think that's outstanding advice that I, in, the, in the book I just wrote, actually, I had a chapter on that. And the way I described that exact same thing was that the, the every conversation you have with somebody is like a puzzle mm-hmm. and you're, and you're just, you're, your whole goal is like a puzzle to turn the puzzle pieces over because you can't solve their puzzle until you see the pieces. Right. So it's, it's like a, it's like a listening game. And a mentor of me told me, a mentor of mine told me early on that, you know, remember you have two ears and one mouth and like keep, <laughs> keep your listening in proportion twice as much as you're speaking. And if you find yourself talking, 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 like you're talking way too much, right? You should be at least, at least a third of the time, (laughs) maybe less, you know, just listening. And I I love how you also mentioned that it's every negotiation is different, just like every person is different. Some, some people I've I've negotiated with are like, let's get to the facts. Let's go like this. Let's let's, let's get out of business, holding their cards close to their chest. That's cool. Like, that's what we have to do. Other people, um, somebody I wrote about in the book as well, named Eileen and Ed. They were the first seller financing deal I ever did, and they they brought these card tables and they like sat there like we're going to tell each other stories. I'm going to hear about you. I want to hear you. I'm going to you're going to tell you my stories. And like they taught me that a lot of people they, they want to get to know you first. Like they don't want to just yeah. like just go right to business. So you just have to you have to be willing to like go with the listen to the seller, see where they're going, and um, and, and just figure out essentially what, what their what their most important pain points are, what they're trying to accomplish. So, so once you do all that, you take your advice and you're listening. I found another objection people have mentally is they're like, okay, well, why would somebody sell a good deal to me? Like, here's the seller, although you, you kind of hinted at it, maybe there's other, there's other things they're looking for other than just price. But even so, like, maybe you could tell an example of someone where they you bought a property for less than the full value, and yet it was still a good a good deal for them. Like, I think that's, that's something that if you haven't been in the investing world for a long time, it's kind of hard to get your head around. No, that is a huge roadblock for most people. Um, and the less you know about real estate and the less that you're in this world, the, the more that seems like you're scamming them or you're like taking advantage of them. Um, I see that, I see that a lot on, uh, you know, uh, on different places on the internet where they look at investors and they see one thing. Um, whereas we who are in the trenches, you know, we know that we're solving problems and we're helping out and we're actually like providing a value here. Um, and so, yeah, so one, you know, a scenario like that would be, um, you know, very close to one that, that, you know, I was kind of hinting at there was, uh, you know, basically an inherited house, um, got a call from, uh, actually my internet, um, from my website. So I got a call from there. I think that they were just searching like how, you know, how to sell my, fa- my house fast in Denver or something like that. So very basic, like <laughs> b- basic, uh, SEO story there. But, um, you know, I popped up, they saw, um, you know, they saw the video, they saw that, you know, I'm, I'm looking to help them uh, solve their problems or, you know, they, they saw a lot of that. So they called, um, inside that conversation was a lot of listening like because it was like you know literally grandma died (laughs) and grandma lived alone and um there's you know two granddaughters one's coming from chicago uh the other one can't make it she lives even further east she lives like in south carolina or something and so you know she's like i'm going to be there in two days we're going to kind of assess what's going on in the house and go from there um And so, you know, could you meet us? Could you, you know, like they don't have any contacts in Denver at all. And so can you meet us? Can you help us? And so, yeah, that first initial thing, we didn't even talk about price, you know, like that wasn't even, even a concern. They're like, there's a lot of stuff in the house. We don't know what to do. Um, So they show up. um, I meet them there. I think that they were like just pulling up. So I meet them there just to, help them with access to the house, help them with walking through, giving them a really good idea. I pulled, pulled some comparables, you know, pulled some kind of ballpark things in, in my head of like what's going on and what I would probably pay for the house. Um, you know, and on that walkthrough, yeah, it was, you know, like knee deep of stuff just everywhere in the entire house. Um, 
And, and you can just tell like how much stress that this caused, that this caused this poor girl. I think she's like 23 or something like that. It's, it's her house now. So, you know, uh, and so she, that was like the number one concern was like, I don't have time to deal with this. I don't have the capacity to even deal with this and it's stressing me out. And so, you know, we, we had this initial meeting, you know, we talked about the, the house, what I thought the, you know, repairs would look like, um, a lot of building rapport, a lot of stories, you know, about grandma, stories about the area, stories about growing up, all those things that, you know, I'm, I know that you're familiar with when talking to, to sellers like this. Um, and, you know, she she was staying for just two or three days, went back to the hotel, you know, was, was thinking, you know, obviously she's thinking more about the house and stuff. I met her the last day that she was there to really go about go about pricing. Um, so in the meantime, she did talk to an agent uh, and, you know, just a, just a realtor. And so the realtor gave her an idea on price. Um, I believe that they were about 450 as is. Um, I could probably only pay about three, uh, 370, somewhere around there. So we're, we're off by quite a bit. Um, and so when I met with her again, it was a lot more about you know, like why I'm at this price and why that makes sense and how we can craft a win-win deal for her. And so what we basically crafted was, was, Hey, um, we can close very quick. So as soon as you have that deed in your name, it's done. Like, like we can, we can, you know, the, the title company will, will be ready. So as soon as it's in your name, we can close within a day or two and you're, you're done. You don't have to do anything else with it. That was very important to her was speed. It was like, I know it's gonna be a couple of weeks for this process to get the, the title in my name or the deed in my name. Um, and then after that, you know, she would have to list it. And so it was, it, was, it was a lot of those pros and cons. Like, so in order to list it, you're gonna to have to clear it out. That's probably gonna cost this amount, like realistically. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, obviously that stuff was a, was a big thing. So we, we just said, look, take whatever you want, take grandma's stuff, take her jewelry, take everything that you need and just leave the rest. Like, don't touch it. Don't worry about it. Don't bother with it. Um, and you can just tell on her face, like, oh, like, I don't even have to like worry about this stuff. And I don't have to worry about, you know, painting it and fixing it once all that stuff's out so that it's show ready. So, you know, I just say like, look, as an agent, I understand like they think that 450 is, is is the price that they can get. They might be telling you a high number so that you'll sign up with them and then you'll you'll end up closer to 400 easy uh, just because it's full of stuff. It, you know, it's going to take a lot of extra time to get it there. Uh, your, your extra expense and you're going to be holding on to it for an extra two months. So for them, it was, you know, crafting a, a, a an offer based on listening of leave all the stuff that you want and we'll close like the day after you get title in your name. And that was 10 times more important than the price. Like I told her like, look, if you fix it up, if you put in 20, 30, $40,000, you can, you can get that three or excuse me, that 450 all day long. Like, I'm not going to tell you that it's not worth that, but it'll need work to get there and cleaned out. And, you know, you have to deal with the agent and showings and inspection items and all that stuff. And with us, it's just done. Like you're, you walk away. You guys have, you know, a fair offer uh, based on the condition, and you guys don't have to like worry about it. And so that was way more important to her and her sister than all, you know, than fixing it up and listing it and all of that stuff. And so we feel like by her trading uh, terms for price, that it was a win-win scenario. And she she thought so too. I mean we never pressure anybody into anything. We just like, 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 look, here's all the data. Here's what it will sell for. Here's the pros and cons. And here's what it'll cost you to get it to where you need. And these are the benefits by working with us. We can close quick. We leave all the stuff here. You don't have to worry about inspections. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And so that was way more important than price. And there's like, I don't know, six out of 10 scenarios where, there is a term, there's something that's more important than price when it comes to, you know, these off market sellers, like the highest price isn't the most important thing. Like that $20,000 extra that she would make after putting money into it just wasn't worth the extra two months of time. <laughs> like not at all. And she, you know, she just kept thinking about coming back to Denver every week or two weeks 
to make sure that, you know, it can, you know, it's ready to sell and the stuff is out of there and, you know, she can move on with her life and, and have, you know, a, a service or have, you know, the, the money that she needs to do what she needs to do. And she doesn't have to worry about this crazy house in Denver that is full of stuff. You know, let us worry about that. Yeah, I really like it. I really like that approach because the of offering a service of information and education. So like you're educating <clears throat> your customer on the options. And I have a very similar approach of not being pushy with it, of being mm-hmm. the opposite. They're like, all right, here's option A, here's option B. These are two options you have. You don't you don't have to pull a wool over somebody's eyes. You don't have to yeah, trick yeah. them. You don't you don't have to like, you know, be tricky with anything. You can just say, here it is, A. Here it is, B, and I, I have found a lot of people, even the even the people who don't go with me, like my goal is like they're educated, they have a good experience, they give they give it a good consideration, and then if they decide that you know option A is better for me, perfect, like this, I have no problem with that, right? I mean that, that's that's awesome because I'm gonna I'm gonna win some, I'm gonna lose some, and but I but you can you can take the same approach which you're you're talking about here of being uh, giving your best shot, making an offer putting all the benefits uh, as a list there. And the other thing that I, I found that people don't appreciate is like uncertainty has a cost to it. Like the uncertainty mm. that, that, that those, those two, the granddaughters had of maybe they can get 450, maybe they can only get 400, maybe it's gonna take two months, maybe it'll take six months. You know, like that, that uncertainty is that we have, all of human beings have a fear of uncertainty. And so we investors, I always try to sell like the certainty of it. Like next week I'll close or two weeks from now I'll close. There's no, there's, there's no like if, ands, or but, and you have to go here and do this. It's like it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. And if you can, you know, uh, if you're experienced, you can always call back to your track record of like, you know, we've never pulled out of a deal. <laughs> we've, we've always closed on time unless there's something weird that comes up in title that's way out of our hands. But, you know, like what we're telling you today is what we're gonna do. You know, versus maybe being sold by an agent or you know, <laughs> being being led down those roads. But no, I totally agree with you. We're uh, we're we're the same investor here, Chad. <laughs> yeah. Well, this this is so helpful. I love getting the weeds. I feel like we spent a lot of time on just a few lead generation strategies on getting your buy box together. Like, if somebody did that, if they got their buy box if they really sincerely hustled for the next 60 to 90 days of networking, of talking to wholesalers, of getting their real estate agents, sending them leads, if they drove for dollars every single week, I, I'm very confident that they will have some good activity based on what your advice was here. The, the final piece of the puzzle that I think you know a lot of people have an obstacle on after lead generation negotiation is just getting the money for the deal. Yeah. And so, so maybe you could, every, this is a very personal topic. I call it like the toolbox of financing. There's tons of tools in there, but you personally, what are, what, what would you say are like a couple of the most important financing tools that you would put together in, in that 90 day period, just to make sure you could have the, the best option to, to buy a property? Yeah. In that 90 days, um, I'd be looking at, you know, obviously it's going to depend on, you know, how much money you have in, to, to put down or that you have to put towards repairs. It's like a lot of those things are going to vary widely. Um, but at the very minimum, I would definitely be talking to, you know, a traditional bank uh, to, to make sure that there's something lined up there that it's, it, it's not everybody's favorite piece of financing, but if you do have a down payment and money for repairs, uh, it could be a really good option. Plus like a lot of these options are, you can have feelers out, you know, to two or three different areas and then you can you only need to execute on one of those, and it's not going to hurt you. Uh, besides, maybe a soft credit pull or something like that. But, <laughs> but having you know having these feelers out there isn't going to hurt. Uh, and then you, the more options you have, the more knowledge you have on on what you need to do. So, uh, so traditional bank, talk to a you know talk to a credit union, talk to a mortgage broker, whoever you need to talk to. Maybe maybe each of those things. Um, so that you have a good idea on where you stand on that so that you know that you can buy it within your buy box, right? Um, <clears throat> talk to them also about possibly refinancing you out of uh, a shorter term loan and uh, have that conversation, you know, upfront. <laughs> so, so not only like, like, Hey, I want to do a purchase loan, but what would it look like if I came to you and I needed a refinance loan over here? Right. Um, and so that would be kind of option one, uh, not my favorite option because it's going to be the most money out of pocket. 
that's going to be your down payment plus your uh, rehab costs because um, the bank doesn't usually like to give you those rehab costs. They're also um, pretty also a little slower too. If you have to move fast on a deal, they're going to be yeah you know, appraisal and underwriting all and all, all that yeah. stuff too. All that stuff. And so yeah, I mean, if this is a, this is a rental, so we uh, we need to talk about. Um, I don't do a lot of creative financing, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to leave that on the on the shelf for the minute. But if you know if you are credit worthy. Uh, I think that another good option for you is either a uh, is either a DSCR loan. Um, so talk to a DSCR lender, so debt uh, debt service uh, loan. And a lot of conventional lenders can actually do these. They just don't advertise them for some reason. <laughs> it was weird. I talked to like like once I learned about DSCR, I was like, who who does these loans? And I started talking to a couple of lender friends, and they're like, oh yeah, we do these. I was like, how do I how do I not know this? Um, so. Uh, so figuring out what that looks like um, for for you in this purchase, um, you can also if you have to move super fast, um, definitely talk to a couple of hard money lenders. the The rates and the prices have come down a lot in the last two or three years, um, so they're they're not as painful as it used to be. You know, it's not like a twelve or fourteen percent hard money loan anymore, uh, but that that allows you to move fast and it'll let you. Um, not have to not have to come out of pocket with all of your rehab funds. And so if, if you're buying properties that need a little bit of fix up, uh, you know, a hard money lender is there for that reason. You could do the purchase and the fix and only need to put 10% down. Some of them are doing like even less than that. So talking to a few of those so that you have that option ready and also talk to your DSCR guy to make sure that you can refinance into that or the conventional loan. Um, those are the those are kind of like the three prongs that I would be talking to in in that aspect, unless I was going for like a creative financing option, which is even harder than uh, just finding a deal in ninety days is finding a creative financing deal in ninety days. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but having some of that bank money or hard money lined up so that you can either move fast or move you know you have money set aside over here for the down payment and rehab. You can if you can move slower, that's fine too. On some of these deals, um, conventional financing is fine on some of those deals. And so at least having those options ready, you know that when a when a deal comes in, based on what, what that deal needs, if you need to close fast, you might have to go with that shorter term financing on a hard money loan, knowing that you're going to refi it out um, within four to six months or whatever that looks like. Or, you know, you, you have that, you've already had that conversation and your pre-approval for your conventional lender, you have that in your pocket too. So you have a couple of different ways to go about when the deal comes in. Now you can pull the trigger on one of those options. Great. And so the, the topic on a lot of people's minds when it comes to financing, after you get those options is here we are in 2023, interest rates are higher than they've ever, ever been on in our lifetime, at least. A lot of us have invest, only been investing for 20 years is higher than I've, I've had it. So if, if, if interest rates are, Eight percent or seven and a half percent on a thirty-year financing. How has that changed your approach to investing? Is it a? Is it? Too, is it make you want to sit on the sidelines? How, how have you approached that? The the higher interest rate environment. Yeah, no sidelines allowed over here. Uh, <laughs> I, knew, I knew the answer. I'm, I'm setting you up. <laughs> no. Um, so the one way that we've changed because you can't change interest rates, uh, unfortunately, is to try and maximize on the cash flow side, and so. Um, at any deal that we're underwriting, we're underwriting at that long-term loan or that, excuse me, that long-term renter um, to make sure it can underwrite, you know, it's a deal. Like worst case scenario, if we have to go to a year, a year long lease with a traditional, you know, long-term tenant, that's fine. Um, knowing obviously we're, we're underwriting it at that investor rate, 8%, eight and a half, whatever that looks like. Uh, it's painful, but <laughs> but as long as it's a deal and as long as it'll it'll hit that long term rental uh, metrics, then then we're OK, um, knowing that either we're locking in today and if it goes up, we win. And if it goes down, then we can just refi and get into, you know, if it comes, goes down two points, that's great. That's just that's more cash flow for for us. Um, but we're really trying to maximize the cash flow on the uh, on the renter side. And so we're either. You know, we're we're underwriting and we're looking at midterm options. We're looking at room by room options. We're looking at short term rental options, if possible. Um, anything that we can do to maximize that side of it, because we can't 
we can't unfortunately fix the eight uh, percent side on the on the loan, <laughs> but if we can, you know, get fifty percent more cash flow with a uh, midterm renter, then uh, then it, it's an even better deal. And if that doesn't work out for some reason, and we have to go back to a long term tenant, then then at least we underwrote the deal like that, and we know that that worst case scenario is still a deal, is still a decent option. So. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say is that a lot of this conversation today. If if you're able to, if you pay full price for a property and pay eight and a half percent, you're paying you're paying full retail interest rate, full retail price. But part of the strategy and the importance of what you're talking about today, Anson, is that if you buy a property at twenty percent below the full value, thirty percent below the full value, that's uh, your cost of financing is less just because you're buying it at a lower price. Like it's, yeah, so yeah. It's, so this so this this is one of the main things we can control is our negotiation, our purchase. Creative financing, as you said, is a whole other subject. That is something I had to do early in my career just because I didn't have a lot of traditional financing options. But it, you're right, it does take, it's, it's a whole other negotiation strategy, a whole other learning to be able to buy seller financing, buy subject to, buy with lease options. But those are another another option on the table. It's basically essentially buying, instead of buying low on the price, you're buying low on the financing and trying yeah. to make make a good deal cash flow. So that's the cool thing. Right? The more you educate yourself in this business, the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more deals you can put together. That's 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 the optimistic side. That's why you and I don't sit on the sidelines. We're like, no, no, like you can you can figure this out. When everybody else is on the sidelines, get in the game. Go in, go in and try to buy some deals. Yeah, totally. I totally agree with that. Cool, Anson. This has been really really helpful. The, the final question I want to ask you in this scenario, I have I have 100% confidence you would go out and buy a deal if I put you in a city of 300,000. I know you would. If What would be the the obstacle or obstacles you could think of? So like somebody does this scenario, what's the likely thing that's going to keep them from buying that deal during that 90-day period? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I think it could go like five different ways here. But I think, you know, some of those mental roadblocks that we we all have to overcome when we're first starting off and in investing, like let's say that you can get over those. Um, you know, it could come down to uh, you know financing options. Um, some people just don't have the, the down payment plus the you know rehab costs or whatever that looks like for you. Some people just don't have that, so that might be a, a you know an, an obstacle there. Um, I think that. Um, I think with the right actions, the right activities over those 90 days, there's no way that you that you won't, you know, at least be presented with a deal that meets your buy box perfectly and and uh, or, you know 90 percent or, or something like that, something that fits in there that you're comfortable with. Uh, there's no way that that's not going to happen. So it's going to be something external to that. So it'll be like mindset. It'll be uh, something on the financing side. Um, it might, uh, you know, it might come down to you're not familiar with the area and you went into like Ohio and, you know, wholesaling is seen as, uh, you know, taboo there. Uh, brokering without a license, I think, is, <laughs> is, the, is the, 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 the term for that. And so, you know, they, you might be going into an area where there's not a lot of wholesalers or wholesalers are scared to do that or they're double closing. And so they're more expensive or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's going to come down to something that's probably a, a roadblock in your process or a roadblock in your men, your mentality of, of, you know, going from zero to 90 days and becoming like a really good negotiator, plus a really good marketer, plus a really good deal analyzer, plus a really good market analyzer. Like that is asking a lot. So there are some, some steps in the, in the, in the, in the way there, but, um, but I think, if you're, you know, if you're laser focused on an area and what you want to do, obviously we're talking just about rentals here. So that helps. You're not trying to do 10 different things here, but you know, if you're laser focused on those two, two areas and you have some of those things lined up with your networking, with your, uh, with your financing, you know, it, it, it it's only you that could probably stand in your way from that point. Um, cause you have a lot of the tools and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the right activities, which is, you know, a huge part of that battle. Well, thank you for demystifying that. I think that's a, a great way to wrap this up. Uh, I know you've got a lot going on on your end. You have networking groups. You're an agent yeah. yourself. You, in fact, are starting a podcast, which is exciting. Uh, I want to I want to give you a chance to kind of hand off where people can hang out with you, Anson, how they can yeah. connect with you, and I'll put links in the show notes. Yeah, I love that. I think I, thank you, Chad. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, if you want to uh, you know catch up with me, I'm either on Bigger Pockets. 
Um, I'm the only Anson Young there, so you should only uh, get me if you search my name. Uh, Instagram at Young Anson. And yes, I am uh, starting a real estate uh, podcast uh, called The Property Squad. And you can find that at um, propertysquadhq.com or the relevant uh, Instagram and stuff. So if you find me on Instagram, then uh, yeah, you know, I'll probably be promoting that for a long time, just like you do. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, so I, I'm excited for that. And, um, and yeah, just excited to keep uh, growing and, and, you know, talking to awesome people like you. So <laughs> yeah, well, th- thank you. And good luck with the podcast. It's uh, highly recommend people check you out this you, you want to find at least in my my opinion, you find a set of podcasts and people learn from who are doing the business who you resonate yeah. with who can you connect with. And so Anson's a, the real deal. He's doing it out there. He's making deals happen. He's in the Denver market, which is not always as easy as some other markets. So y'all check them out. I'll have links to all that in the show notes. And then I'll see you pretty soon in, in real life Anson at the BP con as well. So look, forward that's to that. right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you. All right. See you soon. Thanks. Thanks, Hanson. Thank you. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.